This James is not the brother of John, a part of whom Jesus referred to as the sons of thunder. In fact, this James is the actual brother of Jesus himself. So if you always thought of James, well, yeah, that's John's brother. No, this is another James. That James actually, I believe, was martyred by Nero, the very same Roman emperor that beheaded the Apostle Paul. Uh, he, uh, he cut James's throat, if I'm not mistaken, the brother of John, in front of a crowd of angry people that wanted Christians to be killed. But this James that wrote this epistle here in the New Testament, this is the actual brother of Jesus, just like uh, Jesus' brother Jude that we spoke of last week, who wrote an epistle in the New Testament. James does also here with his central purpose being to expose hypocritical practices and teach right Christian behavior. Okay? Now he's talking to the church. He's talking to the early Christian church about hypocritical practices and right Christian behavior. Because hypocrisy is not going to reach anybody for the cause of Christ. If we're telling it, but we're not living it, nobody's going to listen to us. Amen? And so he's, he's, he's talking about hip, hip, hypocritical practices, right Christian behavior. And here James urges first century Jewish Christians to, number one, pray for each other. It is important to pray for each other then. It was then. It is now. Amen? And number two, help one another remain faithful to God. Now think about that for a minute. Help one another remain faithful to God. Now when you think about the enormity of that, it is my job to help you be faithful to God. And I need you to help me remain faithful to God. You see me messing up, say, oh, Pastor, I, I love you, but have you lost your ever loving mind? <laughs> Now, if I'm doing something wrong and it don't match up, come on. You don't know what has attacked my life or whatever. But he says, help one another remain faithful to God. So I want you to know that's what he's saying as we get into verse 13. Are you with me? James 5, verse 13. I'm going to read rather rapidly. Verse 13 says this. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let it call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. How do we know this church practices this doctrine? Amen. 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 Verse 15, and the prayer of faith, listen, will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. Amen. Come on, all we got to do is believe in faith, anoint them with oil and believe. Yes. Believe. And if he has committed sins, listen, he will be forgiven. It says, confess your trespasses to one another. I'll explain that in a moment. And pray for one another that you may be healed. Listen, I love this part. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Amen. Elijah was a man with a nat nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain. And the earth produced its fruit. Amen. But listen to this. Verse 19, brother, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns them back, let them know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. There's a lot of information there. And the whole message today centers around the beauty of and the power of restoration. Yes. Are you ready to have your soul fed today? Yes. Are you ready for a rainbow word from God? Yes. Are you ready for God to speak to you in such a way that you leave your impact and challenged and changed and you're ready to go implement it in your everyday life and sow what you receive today and people around you? Yes. Man, and I'm not going to get this word and I'm not going to hide. I'm going to take it and I'm going to share it. I'm going to let it bless my life, but I'm, not, I'm going to let it spill off of me and bless other people. If you're ready to hear from heaven today, if you're really ready to hear from heaven, give him a shout of praise, Coach. Reverend Jim Scott, could you stand today, my brother, and declare victory and clarity over this world? Almighty God, in Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord God, thank you for our heavenly messenger standing before us today, Lord God. To deliver the message you revealed to him, Lord God. 
a life-changing message, Lord God, to reveal to him. Lord God, we ask you to subdue any hindrance that's coming to him, Lord God, that would prevent him, Lord God, from giving this life-changing, anointed message to us, Lord God, as only he, this man, at this hour can do, Lord God. Bless Pastor Daniel, Lord God, and bless this church. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's give God a hand clap. Let's give God Today's message is titled, Help Them Return. Y'all say it with me. Help Them Return. Now, restoration comes from the fact that we've lost something. Perhaps we've made a mistake. Perhaps we've failed. And that subject is very hard to hear. It's hard to talk about. The words that I'm about to read you out of my outline right now, it's hard to discuss. But failure is a hard word. Can I get an amen? Yes, it's an even harsher reality. When a person fails at something, they have themselves to deal with first. They've got to look themselves in the mirror and say, I, I missed the mark here. I didn't succeed here. I didn't accomplish what I set out to accomplish. And I've got to look at myself in the mirror and deal with this. But then they also have the reception of those who also know that they failed. How do people treat them when they fail? A lot of times we might not want to show our face after a failure because we're really uh, uncomfortable about how are people going to look at me? How are people going to treat me? Are people going to judge me? I'd rather not even deal with it so I won't even go around them because it would be easier just to stay away from those who know that I failed, from those who know that I missed the mark, from those who know that I did not accomplish what I set out to accomplish. Amen? Now we see that in wins and losses. If you're a sports fanatic like I am, you go up here and you get dropped just like this, especially this past week. And I don't want to preach too much on this sort of subject today because there's a lot of pain in this room right now. Amen? But I saw I was taken up to a plateau, to a peak of running around the living room and praising God. Hallelujah. And then all of a sudden, in just a few seconds later, everything dropped out from under me. And the way that I felt, and the way that I just had to cut all, everything off and just go to bed, I said, wait a minute, I got problems. <laughs> I really have problems here. This is affecting my life. This is affecting the way I feel. This is affecting my joy. I mean, if the Tar Heels don't win the national titles, Jesus Christ is still on the throne. And then I started realizing, you know, I started praying for these kids because I said, how much pressure do we put on these kids? I mean, these, these, this is not LeBron James. This is not Steph Curry. They are not paying tens of millions of dollars to win. These are kids in college. And they turn around and they got a, there's Jordan, the greatest ball player of all time, watching, expecting them to win. They got pictures on Facebook of Dean Smith with angel's wings flying over the stadium. <laughs> I mean, uh, all of heaven was, uh, was counting on them to win it. I mean, really? And I thought, well, these are 19 and 20 year old kids and we're putting this pressure on them. And so I said, well, let's pray for these guys and lift them up. But you know, they failed to win the title. But were they a failure? No. For all the Duke fans, did you have a failing season? No. You made it to the Sweet 16. Now we can hate on the Tar Heel fans can hate on Duke fans all you want to, but Duke is not a failure. That's right. They're not a failure. You gotta give credit where credit is due. Did the Carolina Panthers fail? Well, they didn't get the Super Bowl. They didn't win the Super Bowl. But it's one of the greatest seasons of all time. They didn't fail. Amen. So we, we look at failure a lot of different ways. Amen. And with that, we're able, because of the way we're able to view things, we're able to have a balanced view of where something is and, and what we did accomplish out of that. And then we're able to view failure in a lot of different ways. But when failure comes to that person, they can look at it in a different way, but it still hurts when you didn't get what you set out to get. When you didn't get that. It's heartwarming to see a team that loses the big game get a warm reception from their fans when they return home. That's awesome, man. Then they're going to have a big parade like the winning team. But to see those fans there waiting at the airport, the faithful few, you know it makes the, the players feel good. That must be so encouraging and it is so, so needful and helpful in a time like that. But despite the disappointments in sports, at the end of the day, it's just a game, right? 
I'm still having to repeat that to myself daily. It's just a game. Every time I make a really lousy golf shot, Brother Rassi, I have to remind myself, it's just a game. It's just a game. Do not break this club. It's just a game. Amen. So what about the disappointments that result from the failures in life? That's the real big thing, isn't it? In the end of the day, sports is going to be sports. You're going to have winners. You're going to have losers. But what about the disappointments that result from the failures in life? It can be on so many levels. From the fact that you got fired from a job. No, they didn't let you go. It wasn't the fact that they couldn't afford to pay you anymore. They, they, they fired you. If that ever happened to you and you had to look yourself in the mirror, man, it, it hurt. It hurt. And you learned what not to do again. So it wouldn't happen again. Because you didn't want to experience that again. If you've suffered academically, if you've not made the team, if you were a kid and you got cut from a team, that is devastating to a kid, man. That is devastating to a kid. Or, or how about a failed ministry? I know this is getting kind of negative right now, but we're getting ready to go up here in a minute. What about a failed ministry? You, you, we really believe God gave us a calling and it was all supposed to fall into place. But why did the church go its clothes up? Why did it happen? <laughs> Why didn't we get to walk in the calling that we felt we were called in? What about a failed marriage? It was supposed to be till death do us part through richer, for richer or poorer, through sickness and in hell. We promised God we'd stay together. But we failed. And we ended up in divorce court. And the kids are, are have to go stay with this parent this week and that. And many people live that life. I live that life, but God's a restorer. My oldest son lived that life, but God's a restorer. Yes. Hallelujah. But the, the enormity of that, especially for a Christian. But here's what I say to you. You move on, and you're walking what God has you in now. And you make the best of it. And say, I'm not going to fail at that again. Because if there's one thing about failures, you've got to learn from them. You have to learn from them. Amen. So we don't trip up and make the same mistakes again. That mistake, that fall, did we get back up? That bondage, that sin, did we say, Jesus, I really love you more than this. But if you keep turning to the bondage and the sin, i got a newsflash. You love that more than Him. And come on. Christianity is sincere, is solid, is faithful, and is true. And anything that separates me from a holy God, I have to repent. Meaning I have to turn away. Not just say I'm sorry. Repenting is not saying I'm sorry. Repenting is turning away from it and not letting it separate us anymore. Time in prison. Many people today will feel guilty for that time in prison. But let me tell you something today. If you serve time in prison, or if you've ever been in jail before, you woke up this morning and God had brand new mercy for you. And when you wake up tomorrow, there will be brand new mercy for you again. And when you wake up the next day, there's brand new mercy for you again. Amen? And all around, what we would declare, what the church has coined, the phrase has, a backslider. Someone who was really saved. They were in the truth. They knew Jesus Christ. But something took place. And somehow or another, it didn't happen overnight because what happened on the cross was too powerful for that. If it looks like it happened overnight, then it never happened at the altar to begin with. But I'm here to tell you a devastating set of circumstances. Somebody made wrong choices. Somebody decided to do this and over a period of time they slid away and turned away from the love of God. God didn't let them go. They let Him go. And we call that backsliding. And if you come from a doctrine that didn't believe that and you still hold true to that doctrine, don't think you can't go to church here. Because it's like this. If we believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that He died on the cross for our sins and you believe there will be a rapture and it's coming soon and that He is the only way to heaven, guess what? We can all get along. We can all get along. Because we believe this. When it comes back, we need to be saved, right? If we agree with on that point, then we can get along. We can be in ministry together. We can minister to people. And we can reach souls for Jesus Christ. That should not separate us. Amen? And for anybody that it does separate, you come and talk to me and I'll pray for you. Hallelujah. Because He called us to be one church. 
He called us to be one church. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. Now, in our earlier text, James deals with meeting people's specific needs. Let's look at this. Let's go back to verse 13. We'll go through this fast now. He says, is anybody suffering? Let him pray. Let that person pray. We'll pray too, but we need him to pray. He's suffering. We've got an awesome course here called Discipleship. And Brother James, Reverend James, excuse me, is, is teaching people and training people how to have a prayer life. And they got to pray. They need to pray. We need we, we got Christians today that don't pray. We need to learn to pray. Because, and, let's, and then you'll look and say, well, you know, the leaders are praying for me. Let me tell you something. Your leaders get busy too. And the stresses of life hit us. And all of a sudden, suddenly we go to, get ready to go to bed. And I'm like, wait a minute. How great day. Life happens to us too. So we need to make a practice in the, in the moments of discipleship when we're learning how to be trained up as a Christian leader, then we learn how to pray. He says, let him pray if he's suffering. Hallelujah. If I, my life is falling apart and I call, I better not call Pastor Jerry in the middle of the night. Unless something's really wrong, I'm going to let him sleep and I'm going to call on God. Because I know him too. Amen. Hallelujah. We don't have to have the pastor to pray for everything. Amen. We got to get armed. We got to get faithful. We got to get committed. The very same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive in me and you. But sometimes we get weak and we need our brothers and we need our leaders. We need to know that they're going to pray for us. I'm honored when they said we want you to come in the hospital room and pray. Because I get it. A pastor's prayer means something. And it's, we need to be there for our people. We've got ministers here that go out and pray for people in the hospitals. So I am not uh, commissioned to do every bit of it. Amen? Because I've seen in the years, every retired pastor has said, I wish I had studied more. I wish I had studied the Word more. But I was at the hospital all day for everything that ever went on. I wish I had more time to get in the Word. I wish I could have done some expository Bible studies and really got my church crowded in the Word. Amen. And so I'm blessed that, 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 that older pastors are mentoring me. And I am very focused on spending time with retired ministers. Not just Pastor Jerry alone, but other retired ministers. Those that are reaching retirement. Amen. I love to glean off of them. Amen. And find out what worked, what didn't. What did you learn? Amen. Praise God. We all need that. But he said, pray for him. He said, if anybody cheerful, let them sing. Come on, when you come in here, I don't care if you can't hold a note in a bucket. Sing! Yeah. Glory to God! Sing! That's all right. We got microphones. We'll be louder than you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We started out this morning just singing. Lisa said, I want you to sing some chorus. I said, okay, I've never heard this chorus a day in my life, but it is beautiful. And we're going to sing it. And then we went into surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Praise God. I love that song. Let's bring that one back. I love it. Hallelujah. And we're just saying because we have some joy in our heart because we've been saved. Hallelujah. Praise God. People are excited. If you don't know why people jump up and down or are excited and run around the sanctuary, we are excited about redemption. Yes. We are excited about being forgiven. Yes. Hallelujah. He says, if they're sick, Let's call the elders of the church. Let's call the church leaders in. And let's pray over them. Let's anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick. The Lord will raise them up. He's just giving that as an instruction. He doesn't say, hey, go find out what their insurance is. And, and, and maybe we can get some kind of uh, program set up for copay and all that. He doesn't deal with doctors. He doesn't deal with medicine. He says, anoint their heads with oil. Pray for them and God's going to heal them. And their faith was that strong. Yes. Hallelujah. Over there in Africa, Sister Lord, you're seeing people get healed just like this because they don't know anything else but to call on God. Right aid's not down the road. Urgent care is not right down the road. But they know and they find out because we send evangelists over there to tell them that Jesus is right there. And Jesus is listening to them. And all they got to do is call on His name. Yeah. And saints, that's all we've got to do. It's call on His name. What else does he say? He says, the prayer of faith will save the sin. God will raise them up. If they've committed sins, they will be forgiven. God will make them think that they're condemned, that they're a loser, and they don't have a chance. 
They'll be, con they'll be forgiven. He says, confess your trespasses to one another. A lot of people uh, worry about that. They ask, what does that mean? Confess our sins to one another? Now let me tell you something. You have a right to your privacy. And you don't have to come to church and tell everybody everything. You don't have to give up, get up and give a testimony that you've not prayed about giving. You don't have to get up and give a testimony that you've not asked God, God, what should I say? You don't have to spill your guts and tell everybody about every mistake you've ever made. Amen? It's none of our business. But why is he saying confess your trespasses to one another? It's because if you doubt forgiveness and you confess that sin to a covenant friend, a covenant brother, brothers, a covenant sister, sisters, and everybody can't be covenant. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right? You can't go tell sister so and so and go share it with it. Amen. It's got to be somebody you know. And if they, if they break that covenant, don't tell them nothing else. That's right. But you go and tell them. Why? Because if you're doubting the power of forgiveness, they can encourage you and say, God forgives you. And sometimes we need to be reminded of the things that maybe we've forgotten. Alright? And so that, and also if you've wronged that certain particular person. The Bible says in another scripture that you've had all with your brother, you go to that brother. Yes. If you've got a problem with that person, don't go talk about it with everybody else. Go to that person. Be biblical. Come on, let's have a spiritual backbone. Go to them and say this. I did this to you. I'm sorry it happened. Ha. Will you forgive me? We have this problem between us. We've got some indifference between us. Can we work this out in Christian love? Hallelujah. He said, and pray for one another that you may be healed. He says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. My God, our prayers need to be effective. Meaning we've got to pray, pray prayers of faith. i got to believe what I'm calling on. I, got, I can't just, come on, for years... Christians have been saying, Lord, if it's your will, if it's your will, if it's your will, and guess what? I've been guilty of it for years. If it's your will, if it's your will. And then, and then I realized I am canceling everything I just asked for. I am canceling my faith. I either believe that He can or I just need to zip it. God, you can. Not only are you able, but you are willing. You are willing to do this for me. You are willing to move on behalf of my family. Amen. And he says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. So if we're not living a life of righteousness, guess what's going to happen? He says if, you're, if, if it's the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, avails much. Meaning many things become available to that person. And man, that's where I've been at lately. God, the anointing is worth more than any kind of worldliness. The anointing is worth more. I can go, yeah, you can go dabble in this and you know the backslide. You can go dabble in this and nobody will probably say anything. But God has been looking at the intent of the heart. Why are you doing this? What do you hope to gain out of this? And I have to say to myself, the anointing is worth more. And Reverend James, I don't want to preach without the anointing. If I preach without the anointing, I'm a motivational speaker. I'll get a smile out of you. You might come back next week. But if we preach with the anointing, people are going to keep getting saved and get baptized in the name of Jesus. And that is our job as a ministry. I would get very weary if I'm going to church and nobody's ever getting saved. For six months at a time, nobody's getting saved. We're never having a baptism. Come on. We've got to keep pushing the Word of God. And we've got to do it with effective, fervent prayers so, and be living a righteous life so that many things can come available to us like the anointing. Because the anointing makes it all better. You might not know exactly what the power of the anointing is, but guess what? You want it, and you expect it out of me, and you expect it out of every person that gets behind that pulpit. So we've got the responsibility of delivering you the Word of God in a way that you can understand it, and in a timely manner, amen, that we can receive, amen, and we're all on the same boat as that, amen, because if I stand up here for an hour and a half or 90 minutes or two hours, you're going you're gonna to forget everything I said. i got to give it to you as you're receiving it, as you're able to receive, amen, and that's what us as preachers are doing. We're praying effectively.
fervently. We're living a life of righteousness so that many things can be available to us. And guess what? Is it the preacher's job just to do that? It's all of us' job. We have a responsibility in how we represent Jesus Christ. Now, here, he goes on and gives an example of Elijah asking for something, and it took place. Right? Elijah asked for it, it took place. He prayed, the heaven gave rain, the earth produced its fruit at the end. When it didn't need to rain, he prayed that it wouldn't rain. God answered his prayer. So he's, does, does God love Elijah more than he loves anybody in here? No, he loves us all. But then he ends his scripture by saying this. And this is what I'm trying to get to. He said, if any of you wander from the truth. Now how can you wander from something that you weren't in? Come on. Now listen. I know I said a while ago we can all get along if you don't believe in backsliding. But if I believe in backsliding like I do, I'm going to tell you why I do. Because that's how I interpret this scripture. How can I wander from something that I wasn't a part of? That's right. Jesus said the truth will set you free. Right. And if you're free, come on, you're saved. Right. Because if I'm free, I don't have to worry about going to hell. If I'm free, sin is not putting my life in bondage. He says here, Jesus' brother, anointed by the power of the Holy Ghost, says if anybody wanders away from what they were in, which is the truth, sound doctrine, Jesus is Lord, whatever it may be. If they wander away from, don't live a life of sin, don't keep choosing sin over Jesus. Listen, he says if they wander away from the truth and there's somebody who loves them so much and may not tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear, but tell them what they need to hear. And sometimes it's hard. Because we want to live our life our way. And you give somebody a way of looking at things. No, 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 I ain't looking at it that way. This has hurt me, this offends me. I don't like it. I don't care what you say. I don't care if you've got Reverend, Bishop, Pastor, God in front of you. I don't care what you say. I'm going to be offended. I'm going to be mad. And I'm going to be hurt. This is the way I'm going to be. And I'm going to just walk away from this. I don't believe this anymore. I don't want this anymore. He says if you're able to reach out and love, though, and keep loving them, don't turn away. He means too much. Don't let this happen. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Don't let the enemy just make that, 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 that rebellious feeling where that flesh feels good to walk away when you get mad about something. When you're mad, God didn't answer my prayers. He didn't heal Grandpa of cancer. He didn't, he didn't, he, I still had to file bankruptcy. Where was God in that? I'm done with it. Where was he at in that? Where was God in that? And you decide to walk away from the truth. He says if somebody loves them enough and turns them back to Jesus and they rededicate their life, he says let them know that the person that turns a sinner from the error of their ways has saved their soul from death. Hallelujah. Death is the penalty for sin. Death is the penalty for anybody that's not saved by the blood of Jesus, right? So if they were in the truth, they were saved. If they wandered away from the truth, they were on their way to hell because he said, you just turned them away and kept their soul from dying. What does a soul do in eternity? It either lives in heaven with Jesus or it burns in hell. We're not talking about a body here. We're talking about a soul that's eternal. Now, I know that those bodies are going to raise up in the resurrection. But right now, souls are in heaven and souls are in bondage. And so he's giving you irrefutable biblical proof that somebody can be in the truth, Reverend Jacks, and wander off. And it's our job as a Christian to love them enough to say, come back, come back, come back. And that might be somebody that's in or out of church, or, and that, that doesn't always happen to be the case. Life can happen just because somebody's not in church right now doesn't mean they've backslid and they're on their way to hell. Come on. People have circumstances. There are people that would love to be here right now. Peggy Wells would love to be sitting in this church right now, but she is fighting cancer from everything that's inside her. And so I'm here to tell you, there's always circumstances. People have to, they, they got to provide for the family, and the, the boss man says, you got to work, you got to work. And that's when it's their responsibility to stay in that word and keep on praying. Be here when they can and keep on praying. But he says, if you turn them back, you have saved their soul from death. And then listen to this. This is fantastic. You have covered a multitude of sins. 
We all have the ability and the responsibility when we help bring somebody back. This is it is. And look, you may be dealing with somebody right now that's back sitting out in the world, and you can't get them to church, you can't get them to prayer group, nothing. But keep on loving on them. Keep on loving on them. This is what the Bible says you will have done. You will have covered a multitude of sins, meaning you will help usher in forgiveness to their life. Amen. When an usher, when Ronnie opens that door right there, and a person walks in, that's a welcoming feeling because somebody has opened the door and said, come on into the house of God. And when they meet one of you, you shake their hand. Hi, ah, what's your name? And then you hug the neck. You have welcomed them in and they feel that warmth. They feel that encouragement. How about if we get to play a part of ushering in forgiveness to somebody's life that comes straight from the throne of grace? If we play a part in that, they get to receive forgiveness. Anybody ever been forgiven of a lot of things? And you want to shout and praise God because you know who you were. You know what you did. You know what you were involved in. And He forgave you for every bit of it. How would you like to play a part in somebody else getting something like that? Oh, that's what it says. Restoration is so important. Amen? The Apostle Paul would address this need as well. Give me Galatians 6. You guys don't have to turn there. We're going in with this. Anybody get anything out of here? Yeah, yeah. This is more of a teaching this morning. I get that. But it's alright. It's good. What God said. The Apostle Paul wrote concerning how we should bear and share the burdens of others. In the book of Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. He said, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, a wrong, a sin, you who are spiritual, meaning you who are saved, you who know Jesus. You who have not backslidden. You who know the Word of God. You who are prayed up. You who have been fasting. You who have been faithful. You who have been committed. You who are standing on the Word of the living God. I want you to do this, he says. Restore such a one in a spirit of what? Condemnation? No. Gentleness. When I was ordained as a minister, my pastor said, you can do it by force. Or you can do it by persuasion. But persuasion will do more good. Amen. He said, in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Meaning before we go judge a backslider, before we go judge somebody that's wandered away from the truth, he said, well, I'm going to go witness to them. If they don't listen to me, I'm going to tell them just how bad of a hell you I think they really are. And I'm just going to call them a heathen. And I'm just going, I'm going to wipe your hands clean. I'm going to be done with it. I did what I could, Jesus. Oh, well. You didn't do it in a spirit of gentleness. You failed. Because it didn't come back. Let me tell you something. You love on them. And you let them know that they can be forgiven. And you always have this frame of mind. Just because I'm saved right now. And I'm not participating in the things that they're doing that I think are wrong. The devil is real. And don't think for one minute that all kinds of things can't bust loose in your life next week. And all of a sudden, you're thinking things you hadn't thought about in 20 years. You are thinking about giving in the things that you thought you had booked and you were done with it. You, were you had defeated those things. Amen. I've always said, don't judge the person who's in the ditch, you know, standing on the on the, on the street corner begging or something this week, it could be you next week. And then before we start talking about the speck in their eye, we got to pull the plank out of our own. Amen. Judge not lest we be judged. And always value restoration. Always value salvation. It's so precious. It don't have to be fragile. The fragility of it is fragility a word. The fragility, I don't know what the word is. How fragile it is depends on you and I. Am I walking with Him? Am I talking with Him? Am I claiming to be saved? Am I living a saved life? It all depends on you and I. What He did is not fragile. It is powerful, it is solid, and it will last. But we've got to want it to last. Amen? 
Hallelujah. He says, Brother, if a man is overtaken by any trespass, you who are spiritual will restore such a one of you. Uh, in a spirit of gentleness, consider yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone, somebody shout anyone. anyone. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he conceives himself. Amen. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. We are not the king of kings, but we are a child of the king. He's Lord. He's master. He's mighty. He's all powerful. Not us. So before we get to saying, I think I'm getting ready to go, oh, yeah, I, I'm about to call that guy up. <laughs> I'm going to tell him something. Yeah, I'm going to use my Larry Cable guy. Well, I'm about to call that guy up. And I'm going to let him know. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. Oh, yeah, that's going to get him back in church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, let me come back in my shame. Let me come back and everybody knows my business. No. We've got to keep on loving them. And listen, you can get frustrated when you see them struggling. Struggling. And they sing the same song and dance. And you can think in your mind, all right, I'm just going to keep on bearing and bearing and bearing. Number one, don't shake your head out. Nobody wants to have anybody's head shaking out. But let me tell you something. Brian, I know you're saying it through with the Holy Ghost. I can talk to you about this. Let's pretend. Come on, stand right here. Let's pretend that you're a guy <coughs> going here for years and you've been doing the same thing. And you come in here, you ask God to forgive you, and you get people to pray for you. But the very next week, you go right back to the sin. Here's what I got to say. Finally, after we prayed, after we encouraged and loved, I got to say, Brother, you know I love you. This church loves you even more so Jesus Christ loves you. But you love that sin more than him. And it's time for you to really fall in love with Jesus Christ. Because you want to be saved. And I believe you love Him. But you don't love Him more than that. Because you have yet to turn away from Him. So I want to invite you today to not just experience uh, goosebumps. To not just get your name checked off. To not just read your Bible and pray. I want to invite you to taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Because when you taste and see that He's good, you'll keep coming back for more. Right. I can tell you that, that, that my favorite steak is a flat iron marinated steak at the Long Island Steakhouse. And I wish they would get one around here. Amen. I got to drive all the way to Greenville to get one. I can tell you about that. Amen. It's the best steak I've ever eaten. So they can give me, they can give me some free coupons for this plug on YouTube right now. But you're not going to know, are you? I can tell you all about it and get you tempted. But you won't really know until you go and sit down and taste it yourself. And then you're sold on it. Then you got to go for yourself. Hallelujah. We got it. Look, you're not going to know unless I'm excited about what I taste and sing. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And I, I'm excited about what I taste and sing. And now I'm not pretending that you're somebody else. I know you're Brian. Brian, you're excited about what you taste and sing. And you, when you tell someone about somebody about it, I bet they can start thinking about it right now. Amen. Amen. And they want it for themselves. Amen. But sometimes we've got to you know all the time. When it come, you, God will give you a measure of stick and you'll say, okay, you've done this, you've done this. Now it's time to tell them something really firm. It's time for you to quit choosing that over Him. You can be restored. You can be forgiven. It is time. I ain't saying you don't love God. I ain't saying you don't love God. It ain't got nothing to do with not loving God, not knowing His Word. Thank you, Brian. But it does have to do with what are we choosing over Him. I had to lay it all down to be a Christian. I had to surrender everything in my life. I was not going to let anything block me from the door of getting into where Jesus was. Because the veil's been torn. We don't have to live. We don't have to live like the Old Testament. Where we can't touch the presence of God and we got to depend on the priest to go do it for us. Jesus tore that veil. We can reach and walk into the Holy of Holies. Just because we've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. And we've been redeemed. Amen? Amen. Alright. Have I got a few more minutes before we close? Yes. Amen. A few of you said okay. Yes. It's alright. <laughs> Listen. God's heart is restoration, right? Amen. Godly restoration. Restoration is His purpose in everything that He did. God created creation. And then He still won't satisfy. The trees are nice. The ocean is beautiful. The grass is 
Blowing in the wind, pretty. The sky is magnificent. And the lady they made, they made the animals, and oh, they're pretty, the weather's just growing, growing and grazing out there, but he said, God has something more. And he made a man, and then he made a woman for that man. And when he did that, he just sat back and he said, oh my God, this is what I've been wanting. This is what I've been looking for. And right there, he developed the joy of becoming a father. How many dads we got in the house? Yeah. Do you remember how you felt when you first born? It don't mean you didn't love your second and your third, or your fourth and your fifth. But when you first became a dad, in whatever way it was, no matter what the situation might have been, whether you were apart, no matter what you were dealing with, you were blessed with a miracle of being a dad. And if you're a stepdad out there and don't have any of your own children, you are a dad. Amen. If you're a mentor out there and you've got a nephew whose dad will not straighten up and do what he's supposed to, you are a dad. Right. Granddad's out there that have had to raise their, their, their kids' kids, you are a dad. Mm -hmm. And God's heart was all about keeping them with Him and them choosing Him. That was what it was all about. That's the main problem in this entire world. It's when people don't have an identity of who their father is. That's right. You show me every prisoner that's been gangbanging, killing people for no reason, robbing stores, is a fatherless home nine times out of ten. You show me a girl that'll go out there and give herself away, it's because she doesn't have a father at home. You can always trace it back. Sin and the reason people are on their way to hell is because they have not yet realized they have a heavenly father that loves them. You can always trace it back. God's desire was to keep us. But then sin entered in and a breach was made. And a wedge was put in between God and people. And let me tell you, God cried over that. Why? I gave them everything. And they wanted this instead. And so his heart became all about, how am I going to restore him? How am I going to restore him? Well, they'll have to kill an animal just to get his, his, his fur to cover themselves up. And then he instituted sacrificial offerings, the sin offering, so that blood could be shed in order for them to be forgiven of sin. Then all of a sudden he said, I'm not getting them. I'm not reaching them. They keep turning back to pagan idols. I'll do it myself. I'll take a part of me into a perfect, spotless virgin. A womb that has never been defiled. Impossible, right? Impossible. And this girl has been saving herself for her husband Joseph. Finds out she's been impregnated of the Spirit of God. And she has to go through so much ridicule and people talking about her and thinking that she's done this and she's done that. But then a baby's born. And he grows up to be a 33-year-old man that lays his life down for you and I so that mankind could be restored. Come on, Lisa, and get behind me here. And so we could be restored. I'm here to tell you right now, God's heart is all about restoring. It's all about restoring. It's all about restoring. Hallelujah. When you look at Sister Lisa's heart, God's given her a unique calling. It's about worship. When you look at Laura Pippen's heart, He's given her a unique calling for evangelism and missions and reaching children and helping those children. Could you hear her pouring her heart out when she was talking about those starving children? Amen. When you look at the heart of Jesus Christ, it's all about restoring. Yes. Restoration. Listen. Listen. It's sad in the Lord when people walk away from Him. Trying to explain that slide to you. He was teaching a hard lesson. And they didn't understand it was too hard. It was difficult. They, they couldn't get it. And dozens upon dozens of them walked away from him at one time. Well, guess what? He knew something about that. It was because God the Father had a third of his angels leave him in heaven before creation. Because Lucifer talked him in to walking away from God. God knows what it feels like to lose people. And Jesus looked around and asked the twelve, he said, you're going to leave me too? Peter had to answer. He said, where else are we going? <laughs> Only you have the words of eternal life. I don't really understand what you were just teaching about either. But I know you are the Messiah. 
You are the one that we've been waiting for. You are, you are the one. And I'm not leaving you. Listen, since I've been saved, church, I've had a lot of reasons to turn away. I've had a lot of reasons since I've been pastoring this church to quit. Just go get a regular job and just not do it. It's too hard. Precious. But I said, no, I'm not turning away from Number one, as a Christian, I'm not turning away from the greatest thing I've ever experienced. And I'm not turning away from what I believe I've been called to do. And I believe I've been called to be the pastor of this church. And I wouldn't have made it for almost eight years had I not. So I'm not going to give up. My wife and I have had ups and downs in our marriage. We're not a perfect couple. But I know that that is the woman that God called me to be in covenant with. That is who he called me to start a life with and a family with and have this church with. It is her and I will not trade her for anything. And I will never walk away from you. I will never walk away from you. And if you leave, I'm going with you. I will stalk you. I'm just because what he gave us is too terrible. We have a covenant. And it's not always going to be perfect. Amen. But when it's of God... God is good. Amen. And it's up to us to keep seeking Him to make it better. Not rely on anybody else to make it better. But rely on one another. I want to close with this. I want you to stand to your feet. <coughs> Talk about having people walk away. Jesus spoke of two parables. I know I'm going a little long. But God's moving here. He's touching some hearts right now. So just let Him do what He's, he's supposed to do. He gave a parable. He gave, he gave three in a row. One about a coin. One about a sheep. And one about a son. The one about the sheep was that the shepherd lost one sheep out of a hundred. Ninety-nine. Ninety-nine were left. And one wandered away. When we look at that, we'll say... The 99 will be all right because they've got each other. I'm going after the sheep. Or you could say, that sheep wandered off. That's his problem. He had everything he needed right here. Forget it. No. The shepherd said, 